This podcast is for informational and educational purposes only and is not considered medical advice for any particular patient. Clinicians must rely on their own informed clinical judgments when making recommendations for their patients. Patients in need of medical advice should consult their personal health care provider. From UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, welcome to That's Pediatrics. I'm Brian Martin, Vice President of Medical Affairs here at Children's. I'm Carolyn Coyne. I'm a scientist in the Division of Pediatric Infectious Diseases. And today we're fortunate to welcome Dr. Kelly Bailey. Dr. Bailey is a pediatric oncologist with a particular interest in pediatric sarcomas, and she is also a physician scientist in the Lucas McAllister Lab here at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. Her current research focuses on Ewing sarcoma, a rare bone malignancy in children. Welcome, Dr. Bailey. Thank, thank you, you for, for having me. Thank you yeah, for joining thank us. You. So maybe we could start with a little bit of background. It's always sort of my preferred way of starting these, just to give, you know, us and listeners a little bit of just personal background of you, of, you know, your training, what brought you not just to medicine, but even to research, and then ultimately what brought you here to children's. Yes, I guess I was always a researcher at heart. I didn't quite realize it, but growing up, I mean, even as early, I can remember as early as sixth, seventh, eighth grade, so very early on. Uh, just having a natural curiosity in science was just what made me excited in the world. Um, and so then as that progressed through, um, I was uh, fortunate to be able to participate in a program when I was in high school where they would take um, high school students, specifically female high school students, and kind of get them into uh, college labs like at universities and trying to really plug you into that higher level uh, science experience. Um, at that point, I think I was hooked. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I, uh, I I knew I wanted to get a PhD, and then I, I was again fortunate to work with a very um, strong female mentor that was an MD PhD. She was actually a bone marrow transplant physician, which at that time didn't even really fully appreciate what bone marrow transplant was. But um, you know, she. I would always get samples from her patients, and the one day the person that was the deliverer of those samples wasn't there, and she said you know, she threw me a pair of scrubs and said, "Come down, you need to get your own samples today." So I put them on, ran down with her, but that's when I met um, a man that was having he was uh, donating his bone marrow to a to a to a person, um, and I met both the patient's family, him and his family, and the whole group, and it sounds a little bit. Um, cheesy, if you will, but that was the day that I knew I had to do an MD and a PhD, and I, I wanted that full experience, and, and that's kind of uh, how I knew I wanted to to take that journey in life. And then, you know, as, as far as getting into sub, sub, sub specializing into pediatrics and into Ewing sarcoma, that came through a series of mentors over years, and I was uh, fortunate at the University of Michigan to work with a national expert in Ewing sarcoma, and that uh, if that and two patients that I met kind of paved my way for that sub sub specialty. So tell us a little bit about your research interest as it stands now um, here at, at Children's, and for how long have you been with us uh, here in Pittsburgh? Uh, yeah, so uh, Linda McAllister Lucas, our division head, she recruited me in 2016 um, after I was done with my fellowship, and so I've been here since. Actually, October 3rd was my three year anniversary. So. <laughs> Um, and yeah, so right now I, I'm re very interested in uh, tumor heterogeneity, so the way that individual tumor cells are different from one another and the way the immune system looks at those cells differently. Uh, so Ewing sarcoma has a, it's driven by a fusion oncoprotein, meaning kind of two different chunks of normal protein stuck together in an abnormal way. And um, I'm very interested in the way that fusion oncoprotein causes immune cells to look at tumor cells differently. So you mentioned this was rare. How rare is this doing sarcoma? Yeah. So um, ever, I mean, there are some natural fluctuations, mm -hmm. but roughly between 200 and 250 patients mm -hmm. in the United States annually will get this type of cancer. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's the peak incidence is in teenagers, so that's who we expect if someone is to get this tumor. That's who we expect to get the tumor, and then. Um, there's it a, has a higher uh, incidence in Caucasians versus other races. And what sort of treatment and outcomes are associated with it? Yeah, so if you have if you walk through the door and you have localized disease, meaning the tumors in one spot, um, you go through pretty intense chemotherapy. So you get 
five different drugs that we alternate back and forth um, over a series of months. And But uh, survival, if it's localized like that, is about 75 to 80 percent survival. Mm-hmm. So um, not perfect. We can do better, but it's, mm-hmm. it's not bad. Um, if you walk through the door with disease that's already spread, so metastatic disease, or if you have a relapse, meaning your cancer comes back, then your survival is somewhere between 10 and 30 percent, so quite quite low. And the focus of my research is trying to look at the heterogeneity and that immune response in um, in that relapsed and metastatic patient population. Are there other factors in play here in terms of things that clinicians, a pediatrician who might be listening to this podcast, um, might be interested in terms of outcome and survival rate based on whether it's localized versus metastasized disease? Um, is there anything that, that sort of current thought or, uh, or any uh, education that you'd want to provide to a, a physician listener in regards to uh, early signs, symptoms, so on and so forth, or or co or co factors. I'm thinking, uh, for example, in, in my uh, in my field, we we um, are very cognizant now of the protective effect of the Gardasil vaccine and HPV and how sure. like or, so oral cancer and tongue cancer, which is obviously really 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 rare in pediatrics and in young adults. It's generally something we see in, early, in older patients. But is there anything else out there on the sort of the clinical side of of viewing sarcoma? you'd like to inform our our listeners about? So, I mean, most most commonly these tumors will occur um, in the large bones or in the the pelvis is actually the most common site. So I think not just for Ewing sarcoma, but across pediatric oncology, if if a patient has a limp that's not getting better or a bone pain that's not getting better, I would say just generally speaking, that could be due to a lot of different things, but including pediatric cancers in there. So just to be mindful that if things aren't aren't getting better in a in a kind of quick fashion to, to have a higher referral, uh, a higher uh, threshold for referral. Um, you know, uh, other than that, we certainly, we don't have a vaccine to prevent. There's no viruses that drive this uh, type of cancer that we're aware of, no exposures that do either. Um, you know, I, I think the big thing that's very interesting about this tumor to me is while it can present in kind of common locations, I've seen it present all over the body and in all different ways. So there's not 100% like a classic story like this happens and it's this cancer. I've seen it happen, you know, up in the up in the head and neck region and you know it just present as a headache. I I saw another patient that it was just abdominal pain and it ended up being urine sarcoma. So I don't think there's one slam dunk take home. If this happens, it's definitely this, but just just more globally to be aware that if symptoms aren't getting better to kind of keep keep referring. Sweet. Talked to, you mentioned uh, briefly some of the research interests that you have, but are those interests just looking at the sort of tumor itself? Or are you looking at how to kind of then co-opt the immune system to kind of as a therapeutic or – yeah. If you could tell us just a little bit more about that specifically. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So that, that fusion oncoprotein that I mentioned, it itself being in the, the tumor cell can cause the tumor cell to not be able to repair its DNA in quite the right way. So one thing I'm trying to do is to look to see if I can take advantage of that DNA damage repair defect to see if I can make immune cells kind of recognize or kind of enhance tumor immunogenicity or the way that the immune system or immune cells are seeing the tumor. Uh, so yeah, de- that's definitely an interest. And you know, we use a lot of uh, DNA damaging agents to treat this cancer. And so when a cancer comes back or is metastasized, can we can we be tricky and can we pair things better or you know using the agents where already using, can we time things and pair in an immunotherapy Mm -hmm. um, to try to get better outcomes for these patients? And why do you think this is something that presents, you mentioned teenagers, that that oftentimes, why is that? I mean, you know, presumably there must be something that's happening to the body that would then allow this to either develop or spread or what have you. Are there any uh, thoughts about how and why that is? So there's been a lot of, you know, thoughts of, is it something with, obviously with development Mm -hmm. or hormones or, you know, is there some, what about that teenage year? And Mm -hmm. we've, a lot of investigators have, have tried to figure that out, but no one's been able to pinpoint why, you know, why in teenagers. And it's also um, osteosarcoma is another type of bone sarcoma, mm-hmm. very similar pattern, uh, incidence pattern. So um, I think with, uh, you know, Ewing sarcoma too, there's another s- uh, much tinier but second peak in incidence out in uh, folks of like a around age 40. Mm-hmm. And why that second peak happens too, we, we just don't know. Um, it, probably there is some hormonal influence, but we, we're not sure why. And I don't know if you mentioned this, is it is are, is there differences or are there differences between males and females or is it the same regardless of sex? There's a slight male predominance, okay. but it's it's both males and females mm-hmm. get it. So it's it's not it's not like you know ninety no. percent of them are males. So yeah, if if there is something hormonal, it's I, we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> 
Can you tell me a little bit about the community of researchers that you have across the country and in your role here at Children's and sort of how you play in that? I imagine there are, you know, you're probably given the um, given the, the the fortunate rarity of, of this disease. I imagine there's also a fairly tight knit community of individuals that are researching it. Can you tell me just a little bit about how how do you interact? Is sort of what does that look like, and where do you see the the trajectory of treatment moving forward in the future? Yeah, certainly. So. Um there, you know, the basic science uh, researchers across the country, um, you know, we're a pretty, like you said, pretty close knit group. And we know our European colleagues also pretty well because we like to like to collaborate. Um, we work together with uh, clinicians and I, I mean, I'm a clinician myself, so I kind of bridge these two worlds. Um, but through the Children's Oncology Group, there is a um, there is a group called the New Agents for Ewing Sarcoma Task Force. And I was asked to be a member of that group of 10 people that sit together and we, we try to bring science and what's coming what's coming up in the field and could that be applied to patients with Ewing sarcoma uh, specifically in the metastatic or relapsed realm and is, is there just a better way or a new angle to to really get at that so it's it's a it's a nice and very select group of people. I really like knowing my colleagues across the whole country very well, and um, you know, I've I've kind of been honored to sit on that uh, that board and to kind of be um, one of the the thinkers for what's next, um, especially in a, someone like myself that's kind of early in my career to have to have that seat at the table, if you will. So you mentioned this group that talks about sort of next steps. You know, what are you most excited about in terms of the future and the potential to make an impact on this kind of cancer? Yeah, so um, immunotherapies have really come onto the scene uh, quite quickly, and are, are they're quite exciting. Um, you know, they usually start and in trials in adults, and then anything is, for cancer therapy usually starts in adults and eventually makes its way into the pediatric world, which could be a separate whole talk. But <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think immunotherapies are very interesting, even for tumors that get labeled as as cold. So maybe not the the hot adult tumors that um, are very immune active. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like there are there are ways that we can use therapies we're already using to prime tumors to be more responsive potentially to immunotherapies. But it's going to take a long time to really dive in and figure out which combination timing and and which patients too might might respond best to that. Because when you, especially in relapse patients, they've been through so much therapy already that their immune system isn't as as fresh and ready to roll as someone that's just just starting therapy up front. And presumably made more difficult, I mean, which is good that maybe there aren't a lot of patients that have this, but certainly much more difficult to try to optimize therapeutics and develop new ones, right? It's an enormous yeah. challenge. Yeah. yeah, the rare tumor uh, field, I mean, rare in pediatric cancer, which is already mm -hmm. a rare field, if you will, compared mm -hmm. to adults. So it, it's quite challenging how, mm -hmm. to, how, to best, how to best introduce things. And, you know, we talk a lot about, um, you know, if we have really big trials, are we are we confident enough in this drug and in this combination to invest five, six, seven years, you know, in a trial to get the data out uh, to to see if it works? Mm -hmm. That is that's certainly a huge challenge. I mean, when you put it that way, you're saying investing five, six, seven years whenever we're looking at a at a situation that's this rare, really to me at least, it sort mm -hmm. of snaps it into focus about that about yeah. the you know a decision you want to get right. Um, yeah. And exactly. uh, you know, and where you're going to apply focus and effort. Um, I'd love to ask a quick question about industry in regards to pediatric oncology and, and, and what, what is the role of industry in, in, in a rare disease like this in pediatrics? Are, are companies, are, are, are pharmaceutical manufacturers engaged? Are they, you know, the sort of the five, the five drug cocktail I think you mentioned earlier? Um, I, you know, those are, are probably clearly those are well established therapies, but tell me about the, the, the role of pharmaceutical industry in, in, in rare pediatric disease in this case. Sure. And actually, as long as, as long as you're bringing up those five drugs, yes, they are very established and they're great in their chemotherapies that have been used for a long time. But one of those agents is one that just recently came up as there's a national shortage of vincristine. Mm -hmm. And so we have to try to go through in, in, in therapies that we know work in children, we have to try to go through and prioritize if we have a shortage, who gets that drug first? So yeah. there are definitely, you know, ongoing um, issues and topics as far as just drug supply, even for our standard of therapy. So as far as new agents, I, I think I love the children's oncology group and the way we collaborate across the country. Again, because these are rare tumors compared to adult cancers, we have to work together to get numbers. So we we work under this umbrella where we all, so if you walk into 
you know, at our children's hospital here in Pittsburgh, or if you walk into a children's hospital in Los Angeles, we're all using the same cancer treatment protocols. So um, drug companies engage through that umbrella of the children's oncology group and then some specific subgroups within that for new investigational agents. So um, when researchers like myself have new ideas, sometimes we'll reach out or vice versa when we hear that, you know, we're working on a compound or a pathway that has a drug or vice versa, we'll kind of start conversations like that. But most of the time they end up circling back through the COG. Makes a lot of sense. Well, I wanted to thank you, Dr. Bailey, for being with us today. We really appreciate you being thank with you us so here on the con- on the podcast. Yeah, absolutely. So Happy to talk about you and Sarcoma anytime. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah. You can find other episodes of That's Pediatrics on iTunes, Google Play Music, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to keep up with new content. Leave a review and tell us what other topics you'd like us to cover. Thank you for listening. <laughs>